So this is a pliosaur skull, probably one of the largest discovered from Britain. Um, it's certainly one equivalent to that found in Mexico. And um, my part in this really was many, many years ago, the chap who originally found this, uh, he had parts of these elements, parts of this, especially this lower jaw, stacked up in a little small cafe he had. And actually they were stacked up like bricks in his cafe. And he didn't really realize what they were until, I think it was um, Richard, um, what's his name, Richard? Edmonds, that's right, Richard Edmonds actually came down to film something, went in the cafe for a cup of tea and noticed these big chunks of bone there and said to the guy, Kevin, do you realise what these are? And he said, well, no, not really. He said, well, I think they're part of a pliosaur jaw, but they're certainly quite big. And I'll get hold of a colleague of mine. We've been come down the next day and have a quick look, which we, he notified me and said, oh, he's got a pliosaur, bits of pliosaur jaw down there that actually similar size to the one you've got. Um, would you be interested in coming? Of course, naturally I was and went down there. And what we did, we take these chunks of bone, we actually started to fit some together and realised we had part of the sort of lower jaw. And um, Kevin was quite excited, of course. And then latterly, we said, well, where's it coming from? He said, well, I'm not going to tell you that. I said, that's fine. It's definitely at the Kimmeridge Clay, which is my interest. That was my, my interest was with it, it's Kimmeridgean. And the fact that, um, so, in part, really, he started finding more. And over the years, I think he contacted me again, and I took some of these elements on, and certainly from the back lower jaw, I recognised these elements, I've stuck those together, just to give them a, an idea how big this thing was. So we stuck these things back together again, and I guess he must have found a lot more material after that. And then we got another message back that um, he'd been to the Naturity Museum and they noted they weren't that interested at this stage because, again, it's only chunks of bone. It's not like you see here now. And he, um, he got back to us and said, um, the Naturalistic Museum has recommended me as a link to actually give him some advice on this thing, which I was quite happy to do. And he said, look, I'll be brutally frank and honest with you. Um, I'm quite happy to show you where this thing's come from. So I thought, oh, that's great, that's really nice. So we, we went down one summer's evening, I think, and um, went down with a couple of friends of mine. And he took us to this section where it came from. He said, it's from here. But he said, it's solid rock. And he didn't actually realise that what he was collecting was from a landslip. And of course, as this Kimmeridge clay slid down the cliff, deposited stuff all over the beach, so that's where he was finding this material. And so I said, look, it's from the Kimmeridge, and so follow me, come on, we'll, we'll walk up the cliff, which we did do. Just walked up, and there was the rest of it still stuck out the cliff. And um, we did an excavation that very day. In fact, we got the photographs, or that very evening, and, and with big chunks of bone, massive, great chunks of bone were still in situ. We couldn't do a lot with it. We found a couple of teeth as well. And I said, look, the onus is on you now, Kevin, because I'm not helping you getting this thing out anymore. You'll need a boat. And to be honest, he did. He collected a lot of this and he deposited it at the back of his cottage there in a stream to wash all the clay off, which it did. And I think a few other people have found some other bits of it. But anyway, cut long story short, that time the... Um, the lottery was awarded the Jurassic Coast Trust with a sum of, say, £200,000 to buy scientifically important fossils to actually deposit in museums. And um, they looked at this one, and it was valued at a certain amount. We won't go into the sort of politics of it, but it cost, I think, at the end, I think, somewhere the sum to buy, in the rough, unprepared, I think, £16,000. And I think to prep it, to get it to this level, was certainly probably not including the mount, which is quite a considerable cost. I think it's about 35, 36,000 pounds to prep it to this level. And what it shows you is, is really well-preserved sort of skull and mandible. Unfortunately, we think the tip of the symphysis, the lower jaw symphysis, probably fell out many, many years ago and it's, it's gone. We don't think it's there. Because certainly that was the, the, the front of the sort of cliff where the, this was going back into the, the back of the cliff. So certainly that came out many, many years ago. 
Um, as for a new species, well, that's sort of debatable. To us. Its size is, is great. Um, but when we look at the jaw synthesis, and I'm going to move up here, and we do account from there, really that, in some ways, to identify certainly Kimmeridge and pliosaurs, it's really the, the amount of teeth in that jaw synthesis that tells you the, the differences. And we've got one at Kimmeridge, which is about, I think, nine tooth sockets in the jaw synthesis. And um, this has not got that many. So there is a difference, but whatever it is, it's, it's really, really impressive. I think the only shame, and I'll be a little bit derogatory, that when a pliosaur opens its jaws, the same as us, your lower jaw drops. So that's on a level playing field. It would be nice to have seen it actually with the skull horizontal and the lower jaw drop down. It would look a little bit more in real life what it, what it would do. But regardless of that, it's a very impressive fossil and certainly um, one of the most impressive found to date. So pliosaurs, their feeding strategies, well, look at it, it's huge. So it's top of the food chain. It's described as one of the largest carnivorous reptiles that ever lived. Now this is a 2.4 meter long skull. It's certainly not the biggest. Certainly not the biggest, because in the Natural History Museum, there's a chunk from the Clovian, slightly older suite of rocks, with two sockets like this. They are massive. And there are, from the Kimbridge clay, tooth crowns, okay, which are snapped off, the tooth, the point of the tooth snapped off, but the base of them are this big, so there's some really big pliosaurs out there, and certainly the teeth that we find certainly wouldn't fit in any of these sockets. So, but they're rare. So they are, being the top of the food chain, they don't swim in shoals, they're probably solitary hunters, okay? So the fossil record, especially in Britain, is not that great. In the Clovian, um, they've found well, actually, probably complete pliosaur skull and a lot of the skeleton. But unfortunately, that's gone to Germany, believe it or not. It's in Stuttgart, I think. So this is the only displayed Kimrisian skull we've got. We've got the mandible, but there are other specimens um, locked away in the reserve collections of the Natural History Museum of nearly comparable size to this that actually were once in the... Dorset County Museum, but because their scientific value, they were transferred up to the Natural History Museum, which is something I don't think we would do now. Okay, but certainly we've got bones from the Kimmeridgean period with big bite marks from these pliosaurs impressed into the, the recess of the bone, and they're very impressive. So we know full well that they were opportunist feeders taken live and probably dead prey. So let's look at the jaw arrangement. If we look, you've got much bigger teeth at the front, okay? These big caniform teeth, really huge, and they're matched by those as well. So that's the, that's the thing it would catch its sort of prey with. And to, just towards the middle, where this mandible pinches in, you see it's pinched in both sides, these massive fang-like teeth, would, when it closes the jaw, would come down over there. So that would be where it would grasp the prey. And progressively, as we go back up, the mandible, you can see the teeth gets much, much smaller. So they're the smaller ratchet teeth because once that food's in its jaws, it's not, it doesn't chew its food, it just rips it apart and it just swallows it whole and the stomach acid dissolve the bone and the flesh. So it's, it's complete food value for these things. And they are really um, quite impressive. Now the interesting thing is, just as an aside to that, is okay, what goes in its mouth comes out the other end. And coprolites, fossil feces, why don't we find pliosaur feces, in other words, in the Kim region? And we never do. And bear in mind, the Kimmeridge clay where I collect from is below storm wave base, all that sort of material we find. Lots and lots of coprolites from sharks and fish and everything else. Nothing from this. But look at a, look at a modern bird, okay? It, it eats hard grain, it drinks and everything else. It doesn't sort of poo, it, it does it all together and it's a more of a liquid form. And we think, because they're digesting all the bone and flesh, or I think, that 
it comes out as more of a liquid, and we don't find the, the, the coprolites from these large reptiles. It's interesting. <laughs>